It's time for Michael Morales Torres and Lucha Libre Online. Saludos a toda la afición de Lucha Libre Online. Este que les habla es Michael Morales Torres, integrante de Lucha Libre Online. Y tenemos el enorme privilegio de presentarles a nuestro invitado en la tarde de hoy, el primer campeón Light Heavyweight en la historia de la UFC, CEO, Keynote Speaker, Producer, Martial Arts Master himself, future UFC Hall of Famer, Frank Shamrock. Mr. Shamrock, it is such an honor to have you as our guest. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Thank you for your time and to, uh, for taking the time to speak with us. So I wanted to start uh, about your uh, MMA career. So at seven or eight, you started uh, watching boxing at that time with your stepdad. Uh, you started by accompanying your brother, uh, Ken, to, to his fights in the UFC. Eventually, you decided to join uh, what they call the Lion's Den at that point, which was uh, Ken's training school. You made your debut in Frank Race in Japan uh, for an MMA organization there. Why did Frank Shambrook decided that the best thing to do in his life was kick ass to earn a living? Well, it was always a dream of mine to be a champion, um, you know, since I was little, um, watching boxing and sort of seeing that um, persona of a fighter. It always stuck with me. So when... Um, You know, I never had a pathway for it, and the sport didn't even exist when I was a kid. But through a series of me getting in trouble and going into institutions, you know, I really had time to sort of figure out what I wanted to do in life. And then as I was getting out of prison when I was 21 years old, uh, the sport had just started. And so my um, uh, adoptive father, Bob Shamrock, you know, sat me down and was like, You know, this is something you should do. He always believed in athletics. He always believed in developing your body. So I'd spent years doing that while I was incarcerated. And, uh, you know, I just saw this as an opportunity. And, you know, even though I was very much afraid of, of fighting, um, it, was, it was my dream. So I just, I just jumped into it. I'm going to translate to Spanish just to make sure you were to prison and you were out when you were 21, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. perfect. Amazing story. So I'm going to say Spanish. <laughs> Frank Shamrock eh, tiene un pasado muy extraño eh, y complicado en su vida. En su momento dado eh, estuvo en prisión hasta que tuvo 21 años y este, se sentó a hablar con su padre adoptivo, Bob Shamrock, en un momento dado. Siempre quiso hacer esto eh, para vivir. Eh, siempre le, le apasionaron las artes marciales mixtas. Cuando él sale de prisión entonces es que comienza esta, este arte marcial mixto que en su momento dado fue no Holds Bar a crecer, a florecer en el mundo entero. Y él una vez se sienta con su papá y decide, esto es lo que quiero hacer el resto de mi vida. Uh, so, Frank, do you remember your first uh, professional MMA fight? It was in Japan uh, against Bass Rutten, as far as <laughs> yeah. you, you won by majority decision. Uh, on your first round, the, at that point, there were just a round for 10 minutes. So what do you remember specifically about your first fight? Uh, well, the first fight was, well, you know, I was, very, I was just very much afraid. And even though I had done the training, I never did professional competition before. I could tell very quickly. Actually, I moved to Japan and finished my training in Japan, you know, living in the Japanese dojo. And it was there I sort of realized who Boss Rutten was and that everybody feared him. So when I went into the match, I was very much, you know, full of fear and anxiety. Uh, but the match itself went very quickly for me. I had what, you know, uh, many athletes call sort of that time warp where everything happened, um, you know, just in fast forward. So it felt like the match was only a minute or two. Uh, but after 10 minutes, and I remember key points, like I remember him kicking me in the face and breaking my nose. I remember him talking to me and like saying, you know, oh, I've got you and I'm so strong and, you know, just saying funny things. Um, I remember him kicking me in the leg and sort of the pain around that. Uh, but that's it. And then, you know, then it was over and, and I won. And instantly I was famous in Japan, which, you know, was very new to me. So I'm going to translate this to Spanish. Eh, al igual que cualquier peleador en su primera pelea, eh, obviamente eh, tenía miedo, estaba nervioso. Era su primera pelea, estaba en Japón. Recuerda 
eh, ciertos golpes que fueron un poquito difíciles, como la patada en la pierna. Eh, Frank tuvo la oportunidad eh, de ganar esta pelea en el primer round en aquel momento dado, pues no había, literalmente solamente había eh, un round, 10 minutos, y en aquel momento dado pues se quedó en, en Japón, eh, donde fue su primera pelea. So, you, I, I wanted to, start to talk about, uh, there's uh, this pro wrestler, Minoru Suzuki, uh, but what many people don't know is that uh, Minoru was a former MMA fighter at one point. Uh, you fought against him in 1996 at Pancrase Truth First. Uh, you won via submission with a knee bar in 23 minutes, 53 seconds uh, to won the interim King of Pancrase title. What do you remember uh, about fighting Minoru Suzuki? I specifically remember how smooth he was. <laughs> he was one of the, <laughs> you know, I'd trained with him many times. He's actually one of my teachers when I first went to Japan. Oh, wow. And then after I became professional, him and uh, Masapunaki were, you know, basically my teachers. They were the senior fighters. And so they would teach uh, the young guys. And so I, I, you know, I remember him teaching me specifically um, how to take down Boss Rutan. And he was key into me beating Boss Rutan. But then when I actually fought him, you know, I just I realized, you know, the difference between my skill set and his skill set. He was so smooth. He was so fast. And, you know, I could I felt like I was chasing somebody the entire time. Uh, and it was only through, you know, such a long match. And I think being bigger and stronger that I was able to kind of wear him down a little bit and get him a little fatigued. But, yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, trying to hit him and he wouldn't be there, you know, trying trying to do techniques and he'd already be two or three steps ahead. Um, but, you know, I just stayed focused in it and I, I kept, you know, I kept my intensity up and that's what I was really known for in Japan was just, you know, going all out and sort of putting everything on the line. And that's, that's really why the fans, you know, sort of fell in love with me. I'm going to translate to Spanish. Para todos los que no sepan, Minoru Suzuki, el luchador de New Japan Pro Wrestling, en un momento dado, fue peleador de MMA y se enfrentó a Frank Shamrock en Japón en una pelea que duró 22 minutos, si sí, en aquel momento dado un round, 22 minutos, o sea, tenías que tener una resistencia, y lo que Frank habla es que Minoru era smooth, era, era rápido, era inteligente en el cuadrilátero, recuerda que en un momento dado fue a atacarlo y de repente Minoru no estaba, eh, pero se la ingenió para poder eh, ganar esa pelea, eh, él mantenía su intensidad todo el tiempo arriba y por eso eh, Frank era muy conocido en Japón. So, uh, let's jump from Japan to the UFC. Uh, at that point, you were the first ever middleweight champion that eventually uh, transformed into what we know today as the UFC light heavyweight champion. You uh, defended that title four times, but uh, specifically about the UFC light heavyweight champion, uh, what do you felt at the moment you won that fight? What went through your mind? What went through Frank Chambro's mind after knowing I made it? Well, it was actually quite anticlimactic because I won it so fast, you know, I, yeah. the uh, Kevin Jackson who was the Olympic wrestler and he was just destroying everybody. Uh, and I believed in my submission skills um, so much to the point where I found his, uh, I found someone who had beaten him in wrestling. And I went and studied with that person, Eric Deuce, who became my wrestling coach. But I really felt like I was on to, you know, sort of the evolution of the sport and, um, But I expected this sort of knockdown, drag out, you know, fighting the Olympian match. And when it ended so quickly, I was actually quite dejected. I felt kind of, you know, his arm felt like an old lady's arm. You know, it was like nothing. And so I felt, um, you know, I felt a little bit down. I was exhilarated that I'd won. But I was also expecting, like in Japan, you know, these sort of knockdown, drag out matches. And, um, you know, I was very happy to be the champion. But I guess as a warrior, I just wasn't fulfilled because it happened so quickly. So I'm going to translate that to Spanish. La primera, eh, la pelea por el campeonato de UFC Light Heavyweight, que en su momento oh, fue el campeón middleweight, eh, pero eventualmente se transformó en Light Heavyweight, fue antes Kevin Jackson. Este caballero era un luchador. Eh, y Frank decide eh, buscar una persona que derrotó en su momento dado a Jackson para que esa persona fuese su coach. O sea, que lo estudió completamente, una manera muy inteligente de, de hacer esa pelea. Entonces, él estuvo esperando eh, estos knockdowns, estas arrastradas en un momento dado, o esos takedowns, o esos dragdowns, como él le menciona, pero no ocurrieron. Eh, le ganó sumamente rápido, y así fue que, que Frank ganó su primer eh, campeonato light heavyweight de la UFC, y se convirtió en el primer campeón light heavyweight de la UFC. Uh, 
Uh, you defended that title four times against uh, Igor, Jeremy Horn, John Lover, and Tito Ortiz. And you held the title for 703 days. And you left everything undefeated uh, as a champion. Why do you took the decision of, you know, uh, leaving the UFC at that point and that title belt? Yeah. Well, at the time, you know, the sport was going through a big flux and we were sort of moving from that spectacle into sport. And, uh, you know, as a martial artist, I felt very connected to the sport itself, but the sport was, was dying. I mean, it was, we were getting regulated. We were getting kicked out of places. We didn't really have um, the rule set and sort of the sporting structure that we had today. And that was part of my job as champion was to go around and champion that idea and help teach people. Um, but I quickly realized that the contract I was under was very restrictive. And it wouldn't allow me to do the other things that I wanted to do, like acting and performing and other types of wrestling. So um, you know, I took a business mentor and he advised me that if I wanted to achieve the dreams I had, you know, I would need to get out of this contract. And so part of my retirement uh, was a little known clause that said, should I ever publicly retire and renounce this championship, the rest of the contract is null and void. They now call that the champion's clause. And it's been written into all contracts. So now nobody can retire and do what I did. But it enabled me to take control um, of my career. And, um, you know, it also enabled me to sort of decide what I wanted to do in the future. And when you're under a UFC contract, you do whatever they tell you to do, uh, you know, in, in particular at that time, because the sport was so small. So it was probably the best move, move I ever made. Uh, but, yeah, giving up my title was pretty hard at that time. I'm going to go to Spanish now. Eh, para que no sepa la historia, Frank Shamrock fue, como mencioné, el primer campeón UFC Light Heavyweight Champion en la historia. Eh, tiene cuatro peleas, sostiene el título por 703 días, derrota a Tito Ortiz y de repente Frank deja el título. Nadie sabe qué rayos estaba pasando. Frank menciona que es porque en aquel momento dado eh, en los contratos estaban obviamente bastante restrictivos. Y entonces ataban a Frank de cumplir el resto de sus sueños como ser actor en un momento dado, como luchar en otras áreas. Eh, y, y completar todos estos proyectos personales que Frank quería completar. Entonces, en este seminario de, de hombres de negocio, eh, le recomiendan que si él quería eh, continuar creciendo en su carrera, en su vida personal, más allá de lo que es las artes marciales mixtas, tocaba entonces dejar y buscar ese contrato eh, que llegara a su fin. Un contrato muy restrictivo con la UFC en aquel entonces, porque todo estaba eh, floreciendo y creciendo fuertemente en la industria del MMA. Posteriormente, eh, Frank menciona que había una cláusula que hoy día no está en los contratos, y es el UFC Champion Clause, o la cláusula de, los, de, de campeones de la UFC, en donde Frank dice que en aquel momento dado, eh, con que él renunciara al título públicamente, automáticamente se anulaba el resto del contrato, algo que tuvieron que cambiar más adelante porque la cara de la UFC en aquel momento dado, Frank Shamrock, renunció y pues se acabó el contrato. Y esa es la historia de cómo eh, Frank tiene ese pequeño periodo de retiro en aquel momento dado. So Frank, the, uh, you were ranked as the number one fighter pound for pound in the world. Uh, it, you were named also fighter of the decade by Wrestling Observer, uh, best uh, full contract fighter at that point by Black Belt Magazine. Uh, and three-time fighter of the year by uh, Full Contact Fighter Magazine. Uh, you headlined the first UFC event in Brazil. Uh, how did you feel at that moment to be the hottest commodity in the world of MMA and suddenly uh, leave this for a small amount of time? Were you scared? Uh, do you achieve what you were looking for at that point? Were you happy with your decision? I was very happy with my decision. I was a little bit scared because I didn't, you know, the, uh, my sports career and, and my championship was, you know, sort of the pinnacle of my success, especially, you know, where I'd come from. Um, but I also believed in my mentors. You know, I believed what they were telling me and what my advice was. And I also believed that this sport would become what it is today. So I saw that, you know, even though the sport was dying at the time and we were facing all these social issues, I knew that it would rebound and it would grow and it would sort of come back. Uh, and I felt like if I had, you know, um, the ability to control that from a contractual and from a, you know, a branding standpoint, that I'd be able to make more money, you know, uh, with my plan <laughs> than with someone else's plan. Uh, and, you know, it worked out great. I was, um, you know, I was 
brought into Hollywood and I acted and I, you know, did films and um, I really was able to pick and choose the events I wanted to support and promote. And yeah, I, it, it was terrifying, but uh, it came down to me having good mentors and good coaches and people that understood what I was trying to achieve. I'm going to translate that to Spanish. Le pregunté obviamente sobre, Frank fue el peleador número uno, libra por libra en el mundo, tiene un montón de récords, el peleador de la década, eh, y de repente deja esta industria tan prestigiosa como lo es el MMA, eh, que si sintió miedo en algún momento dado, si se sintió feliz con la decisión, Frank deja claro que claro, se sentía, sentía ese temor en un momento dado, porque la UFC era lo que en aquel momento dado el MMA, lo que lo había catapultado, pero que estaba muy feliz con su decisión, porque finalmente podía, en sus propios términos, y bajo su propio contrato y a su ritmo, crecer en otras áreas. Tuvo la oportunidad de ir a Hollywood, de ser actor en Hollywood, en película. Eh, tuvo la oportunidad de hacer las cosas a su manera, a su estilo y a su ritmo, y no se arrepiente de, de ello. Eh, y le tuvieron la oportunidad de crecer en, en otras áreas, que eso es lo más importante. So, uh, Frank, let's talk about uh, today's uh, UFC light -like heavyweight division, both in, in UFC and, and Bellator. Uh, you have Barry Nemco, as far as we know, as the champion in Bellator, which is an incredible fighter at this point. And you also have uh, Joe uh, Jan uh, Blackovich. I think that's the way uh, we pronounce the name of the USC fighter uh, with the light heavyweight champion at this point. How do you compare uh, today's light heavyweight division of both brands compared, you know, to your times with Tito Ortiz and to the times where Forrest Griffin, Rampage Jackson, uh, Rashad Evans, Dilto Machida were literally kicking everyone's ass and were the hottest thing in the whole brand. Yeah, you know, the sport is the evolution because training in martial arts is always about improving. So I've seen... I was very to get the forefront of the development of the sport. And so, you know, in my time period, there was you know, the, the martial arts styles had mixed properly. You know, there was still singular arts that were more dominant. And that's why you saw kickboxers and then grapplers. And then you saw this wave of sort of styles that were successful. And, you know, one of my biggest goals was to become the first complete fighter, you know, to, to develop a system that didn't have any weaknesses. Um, you know, much like what Bruce Lee talked about, you know, creating this, you know, perfect fighting system with the knowledge that was available. And so now that knowledge has just gone to the next level. Everyone, you know, that trains now is able to train in that complete style. So there's no weaknesses per se. So I, you know, I'd, I'd love to say I compete with these guys. I'd love to say I'd be able to kick their butts, but the reality is evolution has moved on. You know, the knowledge of the sport and the development of the athlete has, you know, skyrocketed. In my time, I was one of the best and strongest and most conditioned athletes, but now everybody is that same caliber. So it's just, um, I love where the sport has gone from a developmental standpoint, because now these guys are true professional athletes. They have, just like in football, a complete playbook to study, and when done properly, you know, they're, they're monsters. I'm going to translate this to Spanish. Le pregunto, obviamente, la división de UFC Light Heavyweight hoy en comparación con la de sus tiempos y la de Forrest Griffin y otros, lucha, y otros peleadores. Eh, él menciona que la industria, obviamente, ha tenido una evolución. En su tiempo, eh, lo, lo mismo de la filosofía de Bruce, de Bruce Lee, Frank buscaba ser ese peleador completo, ese peleador perfecto, que no tuviese fallas. Es un sistema que ganara todas las peleas. Y entonces, la industria ha evolucionado a un punto en donde ahora mismo todos los peleadores pues tienen la oportunidad de, de tener ese sistema, de entrenar en todos los estilos, de poder estudiar todo y de ser ese peleador completo. Y a Frank obviamente le gusta el estilo que, que están utilizando ahora y con lo que se ha convertido en la evolución de, de la industria del de MMA. Uh, Frank, uh, let's talk about UFC uh, paychecks back then. So I had the opportunity to speak with Dan Severn and in the 90s, he fought for a thousand dollars. Like he was yeah. risking his life for a thousand dollars. And now you see this billion dollar bags at the end of the fights, plus the things you want if you bet on yourself in, in, in Las Vegas and everything. Uh, but compared to your time, uh, this million dollar uh, fights with the guys with Conor McGregor, Khabib, and many others, uh, how were salaries uh, in the UFC specifically and in, in Japan back in your time? Well, Japan paid really well. You know, they were, uh, I would say, uh, ahead of the market because they had a bigger audience at that time. Uh, we toured all of Japan, went to all the major cities, went to all the major arenas. And so it was quite lucrative in Japan. And 
you know, that's, that's really where the money was. Um, in fighting in the UFC, my first fight, um, I got 10 and 10, 10,000 to show, 10,000 to win, uh, to beat Kevin Jackson. And then I think I went to 20 and 20, 30 and 30. Uh, so I, I was making money. Um, but then the sport kind of tanked. And so to fight Tito Ortiz, I made $60,000. But it cost me, you know, 22000 to train. So I made about 40, you know, a little, a little less than $40,000 oh. for that match, which, you know, I would make if I were a mechanic or a, a handyman or any of these other uh, traits. Um, so it's, it's great to see the, you know, the evolution of the sport. And, you know, now you can do it for the money. We weren't really doing it for the money at the time. We were really doing it for martial arts competition and, you know, sort of testing ourselves and, um, but one of the key reasons that I retired was the sport was in decline. And so the money was actually getting lower and lower. And when I sat down and, you know, did the numbers, I was risking too much for how much I was making. And so that's when I decided, no, if I'm going to risk it, I'm going to control it because then I can justify the risk better. And I know what, you know, is at the end of that rainbow or at the end of that, you know, behind the door, behind the risk. Um, and so that's, yeah, but it wasn't a lot of money, that's for certain. So I'm going to translate to Spanish. Eh, le pregunto, obviamente, por los salarios de la UFC y Japón en aquel momento. Sabemos que ahora son millones de dólares lo que esta gente gana. Pero en aquel momento, Frank menciona que el deporte iba en decaída. Claro, en Japón pagaba muy bien en aquel momento dado. Pero, por ejemplo, cuando él le ganó el campeonato de la UFC Light Heavyweight a, a Kevin Jackson, lo que cobró fueron 10 mil dólares. Entonces... Eh, la pelea con Tito Ortiz, por darle un ejemplo, que era una pelea top, era una pelea que era para ganar la mayor cantidad de dinero, pay-per-view por todos lados, eh, pues lamentablemente lo que hizo fueron eh, 60 mil dólares cuando invirtió 22 mil dólares en su entrenamiento, o sea que hizo poco menos de 40 mil dólares, algo que él menciona que puede ganar un mecánico en Estados Unidos, lo que es algo muy cierto, y descubre entonces cuando hace la matemática que él estaba arriesgando demasiado de su vida, demasiado de su integridad física, como para lo que estaba ganando en aquel momento dado porque el deporte estaba en decaída. Entonces ahí es que él hace la decisión, o toma la decisión de, de salir de, de esta industria y abrir las puertas en Hollywood y en otras áreas que definitivamente le fue muy bien económicamente. I want to say something also in Spanish. Uh, Frank Shamrock tiene ahora mismo su website, frankshamrock.com. Ahí pueden verificar toda la información sobre Frank Shamrock. Eh, eh, ahí mismo Frank Shamrock slash com slash doc pueden ver su documental un excelente documental de Spike TV eh, en donde Frank habla de toda su vida de todo su pasado eh, al igual que lo que hizo para convertirse en lo que fue y lo que es hoy día un excelente documental que le recomiendo a todos que vean en adición a esto pueden seguirlo en todas sus redes sociales Facebook Instagram Twitter y LinkedIn como Frank Shamrock y en YouTube como Frank Shamrock eh, Inc al igual que eso pueden verificar su bio.com slash eh, bio.fm slash eh, Frank Shamrock, y al igual que eso tiene su organización benéfica, en donde ayuda a veteranos de guerra, eh, y a personas heridas, eh, como jóvenes y mujeres en, en shamrockwave.org para todas las actividades benéficas que le está eh, ahora mismo organizando, porque en verdad es frankshamrock.com para ver este excelente documental, y al igual que eso, eh, tiene su podcast disponible que va, poco a poco van a desarrollar contenido para Spotify, uh, Stitcher y Apple Podcasts uh, Frank, uh, you run a franchise of school Uh, merchandising company. Uh, you are uh, basically the, the owner of Frank Shamrock Inc. Uh, you were at the point MMA entertainer, uh, entertainment and, and mixed martial artist, but you are now training law enforcement officers. Uh, you're saving lives, like you save other uh, people that uh, I read our testimony of a woman that was pointed at a gunshot, and your training was the thing that saved her life. Uh, also, uh, Mauro Ronaldo said that you saved uh, his life, who is also a former uh, WWE <laughs> commentator. Uh, yeah. What is Frank Shamrock doing these days? How is Frank Shamrock saving so many lives? <laughs> well, I have a, I have a, um, I have a very powerful skill set, which is I know how to, you know, defend myself and protect people in situations. And so early in my career, I started sharing that because I felt like it was a gift. And it started with law enforcement. When I started teaching martial arts classes, you know, the law enforcement officers would stay over and ask more questions. And so I ended up developing a program for them. And, um, you know, when I got married, I realized my wife needed more protection. She needed to sort of understand how to do that. So I, you know, I wrote a program for them. 
Um, but it all comes from the training that I did. And it all comes from the experience that I had because I was in the same situation. I was in an uh, unknown sport that was developing. I didn't really know how to fight. And so it was through, you know, learning and studying and sort of having this, you know, martial mindset that I was successful. And now I apply that to everything, to business, to um, leadership. I do a lot of coaching now. And for Mauro Ranallo, uh, <laughs> I actually saved him with the Heinlich maneuver. He was choking on a piece of fish. And um, I had studied the Heinlich just randomly because I thought this would be a great thing to know. And I understood the mechanics of it through studying the body for martial arts. And so we're literally eating. I look up, he's choking and I go, oh, I'll do the Heinlich. And I yeah, totally saved him. And he was the first person I saved another woman in Las Vegas, a total stranger. Uh, who was eating right next to me. And I watched her go through the same experience. And, um, you know, I just realized I had a little experience with Moro. And so I, I actually quietly stood up, went over and did it. And then because I already paid for my meal, I just walked out like, a, like I was some superhero. I just left, <laughs> saved her and then walked out. Never said a word. Nobody knew it was me. And I just carried on with my day. But that's, that's what training in martial arts you know, gives you is that understanding of your body, how to use it, a mindset of dealing with certain situations or dealing with problems or dealing with, you know, challenges. And it's through that mind training, through that body training, through that spiritual training that I'm able to, you know, pretty much do anything <laughs> that I put my mind to. So I'm going to translate this to Spanish because it's an amazing story. Frank Shamrock ahora mismo se dedica literalmente a salvar vidas. Él, él desarrolla este programa eh, de defensa personal con sus habilidades porque él descubrió obviamente que, que personas como su esposa necesitaban defensa, necesitaban estar seguras en un mundo en donde estamos tan complicados. Entonces desarrolla este sistema eh, que ha ayudado a miles de personas en todo el mundo. Eh, hay un testimonio de una persona que estaba con una pistola en la punta de su cabeza, le estaban apuntando con un alma y el sistema de Frank es lo que salva su vida. Pero vamos más allá de, del sistema. Frank salva vidas vida personalmente. Entonces, comiendo con Mauro Ranalo, en su momento dado, él fue comentarista en NXT, ahora es comentarista de, de boxeo y de diferentes deportes. Pues comiendo con Mauro, eh, Frank aprendió una técnica eh, para salvar vidas y eso fue... Mauro se ahoga con un pedazo de pescado que se le quede en la garganta y Frank procede a salvarle su vida. Lo mismo ocurre en Las Vegas. Este, Las Vegas fue una persona completamente aleatoria, nunca la había conocido. Eh, se está ahogando con su comida y Frank decide salvarla en esos momentos. Se esta técnica, le salva la vida a la persona y como ya su cuenta estaba paga, Frank simplemente se paró, siguió su camino y nadie se enteró que fue él. O sea, como un superhéroe, algo súper increíble. Eh, Frank, what are you doing these days? I mean, you are staying busier than ever. You are available on cameo.com slash Frank Shamrock, among many other things. What is the former UFC like heavyweight champion and future UFC Hall of Famer is doing these days? I do a lot of coaching. Um, so I have a lot of, you know, business executives, um, business owners, you know, athletes who come to me and they're looking for sort of a mental edge or, you know, how do they get to that next level in business life, personal And so I have a coaching program that, that, I, um, that I do. And I do mentoring, I do a lot of mentoring. Our uh, nonprofit does a lot of outreach to at-risk communities. So that's you know, veterans, homeless, battered women. And so we have programs that have written same, same process. <laughs> there's the need, there's the concern. I write a program, you know, we put resources behind it. Um, and then my core business is really asset management. So I've developed a multi-million dollar brand and I monetize that, and then I help other celebrities do the same thing, bring products to market, create programs, you know, further monetize, you know, what their assets are, what their skills are. Wow, I, I actually, multi-million dollar company, so let me translate this. Frank Shamrock estos días obviamente se mantiene ocupado, está haciendo eh, coaching, está haciendo motivación, este, motivation speaker en su momento dado, está dándole también coaching emocional a, a mismos peleadores, a las personas que se acercan a él. Es una persona que siempre va a estar ahí pa, para las personas que lo necesiten. 
eh, pero entre las cosas que ha hecho, está desarrollando y desarrolló un sistema en donde crean estos nuevos sistemas y nuevas plataformas eh, de multimillonarias, eh, muchísimas personas han ganado dinero con esto, al igual que Frank, y les está enseñando a las personas a monetizar, obviamente tiene su organización eh, benéfica que ayuda a las personas sin hogar, ayuda, que son los hombres, ayuda también a los veteranos que se han quedado desamparados, a las madres, eh, y a los niños que están este, heridos o desamparados de igual manera y es un excelente gesto para todas las personas que quieran saber más sobre su organización está disponible en shamrockway.org shamrockway.org ahí pueden escuchar de todo y enterarte de todo lo que está pasando con la organización benéfica y las diferentes actividades benéficas que tiene Shamrock eh, para, para esto uh, Mr. Frank, last but not least uh, since we are also a pro wrestling brand I want to talk to you about Uh, pro wrestlers uh, making the the switch into the fighting to the in the octagon. So we have guys like Brock Lesnar, CM Punk, Bobby Lashley, Dave Bautista, Thunder Rosa, Alberto El Patron, uh, and even Jake Hager right now in Bellator. What are your thoughts about pro wrestler uh, or pro wrestlers uh, deciding to expand their horizons and jumping inside the octagon? I love it. You know, I think the, the sport is, you know, athletic character driven. And that's exactly what professional wrestling is. And, you know, when I was a young guy, I watched professional wrestling and I studied it because, um, you know, those are very important characters to society, you know, because they're a mirror of us. And so, so when you have someone who understands, you know, how to portray a character and then already understands how to use their body, And that's the hardest part about fighting is you, you're using your body as a tool, an, a tool of art. And professional wrestlers already have that. So it's a natural transition for them to move into everything that's athletic and entertainment based. So I love, I love the crossover and I hope there's more of it. You know, the only downside is, you know, mixed martial arts fighting is very real and there's <laughs> very real and dangerous injuries. <laughs> that people are purposely trying to inflict on you. In wrestling, it's accidental. You know, someone accidentally misses the move or you take a bad bump. But, you know, in fighting, we're all trying to hurt each other. And so that's the only learning curve, you know, that really needs to be, you know, leaped over for those guys to make the jump. But I love, I love the combination of it. And it's something I employed early on, you know, define your character, you know, stand for something important and then make sure you're always delivering both the character and your performance. I'm going to translate to that. Le pregunto sobre el, el cambio que han hecho muchas superestrellas de la lucha libre al mundo del MMA como Brock Lesnar, CM Punk, Jake Hager, entre muchos otros. Y a Frank le encanta la transición. Entiende que es algo muy natural porque obviamente son atletas naturales, son personas que tienen ese carisma, tienen ese personaje. Y entonces la transición surge muy natural, pero menciona algo bien importante. Y es que en la industria de la lucha libre las lesiones son accidentales. Tú no estás intencionalmente intentando lesionar a alguien, pero en el MMA sí. Entonces ahí ocurre este golpe duro con la realidad en donde las personas pues sufren esta lesión y muchos de ellos eh, tal vez se frustran, pero definitivamente necesitamos más personas eh, que pasen de esa industria de la lucha libre a la MMA para desarrollar este personaje. Uh, Mr. Shamrock, first of all, it's been such an honor, sir, to have you as our guest. And I want to close this interview with one of your quotes. Fighting is art and there's nothing that is more beautiful than the painted canvas of a totally kicking someone's ass. <laughs> What a it, is true. <laughs> it is true it is true but i think that's a lot of what um drives people to the sport is you get to see in a very short period of time you know either the birth of somebody's spirit or or the crumbling of it and you know we go through those you know life experiences and it takes it's a long time it takes years you know for us to see that in our personal lives and for us to experience those ups and downs in our personal life. And sometimes we look back and we're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. But in mixed martial arts, it all happens in 25 minutes. <laughs> you get to you know, see your guy, see his journey. And then you know, there's a, a very human interaction with that result. And that's what is so beautiful about this sport. And when done properly, it is absolutely beautiful. You know, to to take someone on that journey, both as a entertainer and then as a spectator, like it's a it's a wonderful thing. Perfect, sir. Thank you so much for your time and for your words of wisdom. Para toda nuestra afición, síganlo en su Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn como Frank Shamrock, YouTube Frank Shamrock Inc. Cambio.com/slash Frank Shamrock. 
frankshamrock.com slash doc para el documental, entre muchísimas otras alternativas, frankshamrock.org eh, disculpa, shamrockway.org para su organización benéfica we thank you so much for your time and for your words of wisdom sir, and we're always wishing you the best of luck in all your projects, thank you sir thank you